Good morning, everyone. And good morning to all who are watching us this morning. You're all very welcome. A special welcome today to Neil Harrison, who's sitting just here at the front. Um, some of you know Neil, I know, from days gone by, about 15 years ago, Neil. So you're very welcome back to Abbey. Neil works as a mission development officer with PCI, and we really look forward to what you have to say to us this morning, Neil. So thank you for coming to be with us. So it's my duty this morning to see who, who we have to celebrate birthdays with. So I've been keeping a wee eye on Facebook. Oh, and Agnes, you kept that quiet. So Agnes has a birthday. So happy birthday, Agnes. And a young lady called Rose. How old are you, Rose? Eight? Oh my goodness. That's worth a round of applause, isn't it? Agnes, that's for you too. And then we also have another birthday girl. I just can't see at the moment, Olive. Happy birthday, Olive. It's always lovely to celebrate with our church family, but also we share in sad times with those in our church family. And it's my sad duty this morning to announce the death of Louis Stewart, who will be known to many of you. Louis passed away last Monday following an illness which she battled with courage and dignity. Louis's funeral will be here on the 2nd of November, which is Tuesday at 12.30. As a congregation, we want to extend to her son David and the entire family circle our deepest sympathy at this time. And I would ask that you would remember David and the family in your prayers. Thank you. I'm going to hand over to Neil, and he's going to take us through the rest of our service. Thank you. Thank you for your very warm welcome, and it's great to be here with you this morning. Um, as noted already, I, I, I was familiar uh, with this congregation uh, 15 years ago, we, I, uh, well, 20 years ago, we arrived here. There was a team of us with Youth for Christ, and we were working uh, in the Green Hut when the Green Hut was still a Green Hut, um, just across the road. And we were here, well, I was here for about five years in total, and was in and out of this congregation many times, and uh, always ha had a very warm welcome, very warm relationship. Uh, and great help and great volunteers with some of the work that we were involved with for, for, for young, with young people for those five years. So it's great to be back. I was very, uh, was delighted actually whenever Alan uh, extended the invite uh, to be here. So uh, you're, you're very, it, it's, it's good to see people here and it's good to see at least a few familiar faces. Yeah. I've spoken to a few people already. So uh, thank you for, for being with us this morning. Um, once I, when I left here, I, I went to work in Waringstown Presbyterian Church. I still worship there and uh, was there for about 12 years on staff in a youth and community role and I kind of moved into I suppose a community uh, outreach working role in that in that particular area and then just about uh, almost four years ago then I took up this position of mission development office officer with PCI. So I work centrally uh, in uh, assembly buildings or church house as you might know it and um, my role is to, to be out and about in congregations, helping to support and equip and encourage them to be involved in mission both locally and also uh, globally. Uh, so I, I really enjoy the richness of that, the breadth of that, the variety of that, and being out and around in congregations is, is great. In fact, last week I was in assembly buildings, walking up the stairs and bumped into no, none other than John Seawright, who uh, I haven't seen in, a, I've seen him some, you know, maybe once or twice uh, since I started in assembly buildings. But I was saying to him, that I was coming to Abbey soon, and uh, he he asked me to send his greetings to you as well. So uh, John is looking well, hasn't changed a bit, um, so uh, he sends his greetings. Um, why are you here? Maybe this seems an odd question to ask, but let's think about that. I don't know about you, but um, if I know that I'm going out to a restaurant, which we haven't really been able to do that much uh, in the past uh, couple of years. But and if I know I'm going out to a restaurant, then I, I actually I find that I get hungry on my way, w on my way there. 
I, I just thinking about going to a restaurant makes me feel hungry and I get even hungrier when I get into the restaurant and I sit down and I read the menu oh then I get really hungry and I make my order and then I just you know you, you know that you know the feeling of just feeling really hungry whenever you have this sense of anticipation about what is about to pass over your lips are you hungry for God's word like physical hunger, does, does it increase with the expectation of being fed? Do you come to church with the expectation to hear from God? Are you thinking about it on your way here on a Sunday morning? Are you preparing for it as you sing songs of worship? Are you attentive when God's word is read aloud and when it's taught by the preacher. This morning, as we begin our service, let's just pause for a moment. Let's look to God and let's allow that hunger to grow in our hearts with great expectation of what could take place in the next hour. Psalm 121. I lift my eyes up to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us each and every day. We thank you for these beautiful words from the Psalms that remind us that you watch over us. You'll neither let our, our, our foot slip. Father, we pray, Lord, as we come to lift our eyes to you this morning. May you remove any distractions that might be around us Help us to set aside uh, those thoughts that are distracting us, that unfinished task or uh, something at home, that conversation that you mightn't have quite got finished. Help us to set those things aside. Help us to open our eyes to see you and open our ears to hear what you have to say to each of us from your word this day, God. Pray as your spirit moves in each of our lives, Lord, that this might be a time together where we leave feeling encouraged, refreshed, and challenged. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to stand and sing together now, Come People of the Risen King, and Come Now is the Time to Worship.
children in rejoice rejoice let every tongue rejoice one heart one voice for church of Christ rejoice joy is morning sun and those weeping through the night come those who tell of battles won and those struggling in the fight for his perfect love will never change and his mercies
just as you are to worship. Come, just as you are before your God. Come, come, come. I'm going to take just a few minutes to speak to the children before they leave, and uh, I'm looking primarily to this corner where I see some children, and then maybe might be some over here as well. So there's a question that I have, if we can maybe show this on the screen uh, for you. If you can tell me what this picture is from, do you know? Oh, yes. And Incredibles, yes. So the Incredibles logo from the movie Incredibles. Hands up if you've seen the movie Incredibles. Some adults as well. Fantastic. Okay. So uh, what I love, or I, I want you to try and help me just remind me and remind the rest of the people in the room here, uh, each of the characters. So wh what? who are these characters? Can you tell me the names of these characters? So who's this guy? Do we know his name? Yeah. Mr. Incredible, yeah, and what was his um, super ability? Yeah, super strength. So Mr. Incredible had super strength. Okay, we've got the idea here. Now, who is this person? Can anyone remember this person's name? Uh, keep going to this corner, but there has to be other people who know this. Anybody else know this person's name? Elastigirl, yes, that was an adult said that, fantastic, Elastigirl. So, the clue is in the name, but what's her super ability? She stretches, so she can stretch her arms really, really far, she can kind of turn her whole body into a parachute and all of that, brilliant. Now, it starts to get a little bit more difficult. Can we remember this person's name? Yeah, okay, we'll go to you again, yeah? Violet, right? So Violet is their daughter. Now, what is Violet's ability? Can we remember that? Anybody remember what Violet can do? Yes. So she can, she can kind of create this like force field around her as well, can't she? Um, okay. This guy, what's his name? Hmm. Dash, yes, Dash. So again, anybody over here, what was his super ability? Speed, yeah, so he can run so fast that he can actually run over the top of water and he doesn't even sink, it's so fast. And the last member of the family is called, yeah, Jack-Jack, yeah. What can Jack-Jack do? Can you remember? He can disappear, yeah, he can do lots of different things, actually. He can turn himself into, like, a fireball and everything, can't he? So Jack Jack can do lots of different things. And then the last guy in the team is called Frozone. You can see him in that picture as well. But what I love about this movie is that there is no one single hero. Lots of superhero movies, it's all about one person. This movie's not like that. It's about the whole team together they get things done. And that really reminds me of 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, where it says, God's gifts of grace come in many forms. Each of you has received a gift in order to serve others. You should use it faithfully. If anyone speaks, they should do it as one speaking God's word. words. If anyone serves, they should do it with the strength that God gives. And then in all things, God will be praised through Jesus Christ. Glory and power belong to him forever and ever. Amen. I think that the church is a great example of this togetherness. You can't really do all the things in the life of your church on your own, can you? I mean, you, you can't run a BB or a GB or a PW on your own. Contributing even as a group to the food bank, which I know that this church does as well. You can't do those things on your own but you do it together. Nor would Sundays work very well if Alan had to do everything. And that's why 
Thelma's out there greening people at the door, and we've got the guys over here on the sound desk. Can't we have to do things together? Church is full of all sorts of people with different gifts and abilities, and the passage says that we should use our gifts to serve others. So we are all in this together. We're told in this passage that we should use our gifts faithfully. What does that mean? Well, it kind of means that we shouldn't serve some people and not others. And we shouldn't just serve on one day of the week and not the rest. So we need to be faithful and we need to be steady in how we serve God. But how do we do this? Well, verse 11 uh, in this passage highlights two areas. So it says, if anyone speaks, they should do it as one speaking God's words. If anyone serves, they should do it with the strength that God provides. So the two things here are words and our actions. Firstly, our words. We're told to speak as if we are speaking God's words. Two things here. Well, that means we tell people about Jesus, uh, and we are to do that using our words. But it also means that using our words faithfully means that we need to encourage people. We need to tell the truth. We need to be people who speak out when something is wrong. So being faithful to God is using our words for good, even whenever that can be really hard. And I know that sometimes in school, that's going to be really hard. But this verse always also asks us to think about our actions when it talks about serving. We're told to serve in the strength that God provides. So we're to help others, not just our family and friends and the people who are nice to us, because that's easy. But we're also to help those who are maybe not so nice to us. And that's when we need God's strength. So together as a church, we're to use our gifts and our abilities faithfully to benefit anyone that we meet using our words and our actions. So maybe you're thinking, oh, here we go again. The church is telling me I need to say nice things to help people and I need to do all of that in order to please God. Nothing new there. And you'd be right. But here's the thing. I'm not always faithful in these things. And I'm guessing neither are you. I can be careless with my words. I can put others down at times. I don't always speak up for what's right. Maybe sometimes I'm not always very good at helping people who are not just my friends. Sometimes I'm just selfish. And so I guess you could say that I'm not very faithful. And if I think about that, and if I think it, about it like that, well then really I'm not very pleasing to God then. Because it makes me then feel like I'm a bit of a failure. And that makes me feel guilty. Maybe that's your experience of what it means to be a Christian. Someone who tries really hard to be nice in order to please God. And that feels like a heavy burden. And you're thinking to yourself, this bloke is going to tell me that that's good news. Catch yourself on. That doesn't sound very good news to me. And you'd be right to think like that. So let me tell you what is the good news. The good news is that Jesus is the one who is always faithful. Despite my unfaithfulness, despite my failures, in fact, he already knows that we are unfaithful. And the good news is that his love and acceptance of us is because of the cross. Jesus died and rose again to pay the price for our mistakes and our failures. And so the good news is that our relationship with him is not one where we should feel guilty, but one where we should feel forever thankful. And surely that sounds more like good news more like a good news that you would want to be part of. In fact, we are so thankful for Jesus that we then want to live in a way that pleases him. So we try our best to tell others 
about Jesus and speak words that are true and stand up when we say, and say no when we know that something is wrong. Not because we want to please God, but because our hearts are forever thankful to him. And we want to help those who are not naturally our friends because we have a God who reached down to help and to rescue us when we were not his friends. And it's not because we have to, but it's because we want to. And he gives us the strength to do that. So boys and girls, we're reminded today that we are not supposed to follow Jesus on our own. We are doing this together. And our passage reminds us that together as a church, we are to use our gifts and abilities faithfully to benefit everyone we meet using our words and our actions. And with thankful hearts for Jesus, know that in the midst of all of our failings, he still loves us. He accepts us. And that's the good news. Let me pray for you as you, uh, as you leave. Uh, um, we're going to sing a song as well. But Father, we thank you for this good news. I pray, Lord, that that dwells deep in our hearts, that it, it d dwells so deeply, Lord, that it does work itself out in our words and actions and how we live each day in your strength. I'm thankful for all that you have done for us in Jesus. Amen. So we're going to stand and sing uh, far and near, hear the call, after which the children will be leaving for Sunday school, and then Johnny will come and lead us in our prayers. Far and near, hear the call, worship Him, Lord of all, families of nations call, celebrate what God has done, deep and wide.
Let's pray. Lord, we come before you this morning, thankful that you are a God that hears and answers prayer. We are thankful for the privilege of being able to meet together and to worship you. Lord, we want to pray this morning for our leaders, locally, nationally, and internationally. We ask that you would give them wisdom as they deal with many challenges and opportunities that they face. We pray particularly this morning for the Global Climate Conference, COP26, taking place this week in Glasgow. We ask that there would be a collective willingness across all nations represented to act for the long-term benefit of all, and that this would in turn inspire us individually to play our part. We bring before you today our church family here in Abbey. We think of those who have recently been bereaved, and we pray that you would comfort them. We pray for those who are currently struggling in difficult circumstances and ask that you would help them, be close to them, and bring healing where it is needed. Lord, we want to pray for Alan and his family today, that this past week will have been a time of rest for them all. We pray too for the Kirk Session and the Congregational Committee in the, in the days that lie ahead, navigating the decisions that need to be made, seeking your will for this community, and being part of building your kingdom here in Monkstown. Finally, Lord, we thank you for bringing Neil to be with us this morning, and we pray that you would speak through him as he shares with us. Lord, bless him in his role with PCI, and use him mightily as he works for you across the wider church. We ask all these things in your son's precious name. Amen. Thanks, Johnny. Um, I have an image on the screen here. Um, thinking a little bit about outreach, and I know that that's something that you have been thinking about recently. So toddler groups, bowling clubs, uniformed organizations, these are the things that have been at the front end of local outreach within PCI congregations for decades. And yet many uh, churches, uh, and, and along with the ever-changing restrictions, mean that these things have often not been able to take place safely over the past 18 months, and, and maybe some of these things are just beginning to resume within the life of congregation as we slowly move into a new phase of the pandemic with, with the easing of restrictions. And as we enter that, that kind of phase, might there also be space to consider how we can begin to recover our outward vision and our witness to others? The story of God in the Bible is a wash with hardship placed on God's people at various times and places through slavery, persecution, and exile. Our God is revealed as a God of mission, and he has called us to be a missional people as we seek to be a witness to others regardless of our circumstances. We're called to go and make disciples. And the passage that we're looking at this morning from Acts chapter 19, uh, beginning to read at verse 8. If you have a Bible with you, then you can, you can turn to that and keep it open with you. Acts chapter 19. But this particular passage gives an account of one such story of Paul's ministry in Ephesus. So verse 8, Paul entered the synagogue and he spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Just three verses that we're focusing on. So in this passage, for three months, Paul had been teaching and persuading the Jews about the kingdom of God until some opposition arose around this message. 
such that the synagogue was no longer available to him. The need for change was imposed in, upon Paul in a way that was neither expected or welcomed. I'm sure it was frustrating. The synagogue was a familiar environment. For him, he knew the culture. And he knew the language. He knew the behaviors. He uh, came from a Jewish background himself. So he understood their starting point. And he was comfortable and accomplished at uh, persuading Jewish people about the kingdom of God. They were his people. He loved them and he longed for them to discover the way. So not only would Paul have been frustrated, but I'm sure he would have been saddened and hurt by this opposition. And it would have been easy for Paul to be overwhelmed by this reality. But instead, he is open to a new opportunity as he quickly shifts to a more neutral location where he can continue sharing his message. And three things stand out here as Paul shifts mindset from the reality to the opportunity. And the first thing is the new people. The new location, with its neutrality, gave Paul a whole new audience for his message. Verse 10 tells us that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. I think it's safe to assume that the Greeks were not going to go to the synagogue to hear Paul speak. So all of a sudden, by leaving the synagogue, Paul has massively widened the reach of his message by basing himself in a more neutral and accessible location. I think, if we're honest, when we centralize our outreach within our church buildings, then often we only end up speaking to Presbyterians. And of course, many Presbyterians need to hear the gospel. But there are many, many more outreach, uh, unreached people within our community who also need to hear the good news. I've been encouraged recently to hear stories from across the denomination of Bible studies or explore courses taking place in a local hotel, in a cricket club, and a community center, all in an effort to try and be more accessible to new people. So he reaches new people. Secondly, softer tone. Paul recognizes the broader audience necessitates a different tone. In the synagogue, we're told that he was arguing persuasively as he sought to convince the committed Jewish people that Jesus was the Messiah. Now, that was a difficult pill for them to swallow, given their role in his death and their unwillingness to accept any talk of a resurrection. But in the lecture hall, Paul recognizes that the Greek listeners are not coming with the same baggage and are perhaps more open to hear what he is saying without pushing back. So verse 9 tells us that he had discussions daily in the lecture hall. Now that's certainly a softer tone than arguing persuasively. How wonderful it is to have discussions about the good news of Jesus with those who are hearing it for the first time. And we don't need to go to the other side of the world to find people like this. We, we live in a society that is almost unrecognizable to a generation ago. Second and third generations of unchurched people who don't carry the religious baggage or hurt of their parents or grandparents, and they have little interest or concern for organized religion. A society where social media dominates and shapes the stories that people talk about every single day. A city only a few miles from here that is increasingly diverse with a wide and whole range of nationalities seeking to make this place their home. A university nearby packed with students whose opinions and worldview are still being formed and shaped. A wider community where people give increasingly less importance to the labels 
of Catholic and Protestant. How, like Paul, might our language and tone change if we thought that half of our audience were unreached people with little knowledge of the Bible and no experience of church. So he reached new people. He reached them with a softer tone. And thirdly, he reached them with the same message because the good news of the gospel is unchanged. The people are hearing the same message about the kingdom of God Verse 8, and the word of the Lord, in verse 10, the people might be different, the tone might be softer, but the message is the same. And in the favor of the Lord, Paul went unhindered for two years in which all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord, as it says in verse 10. Now, I can only guess that the frustration and hurt that Paul felt when he was no longer welcome at the synagogue quickly shifted to joy and excitement at the opportunity to share the good news with those that wanted to hear it. The indication when you scroll further down to verse 26 is that large numbers of people became followers of Jesus in Ephesus and the province of Asia. Opposition, change, Discomfort are no barrier to the work of the Holy Spirit. As a missional people, we believe that God has placed us in a specific place at a specific time with a specific group of people for a purpose. And that purpose is to further the mission of God as part of pe- the people of God, the church, our family, our friends, our neighbors, our colleagues are not around our lives by accident, but they are there as recipients of our loving witness as we seek to, in the words of 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 8, share with them not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Sharing our lives and sharing the gospel are both essential in communicating the good news of Jesus to others. But how do we do this? in the context of the bleak picture of society that we have just described. Well, the churches that are growing across PCI have understood this reality, and like Paul in Ephesus, have found ways to adapt and welcome new people into church life. People with no Presbyterian background have found their home in God's family, and in turn have enriched the worshiping community with their fresh insight. One example of this would be uh, Craigavon Presbyterian, a declining congregation of around 40 people on the edge of a housing estate in 2014. And seven years on from that, the congregation is a vibrant worshiping community of, of around 150 people. A large majority of folk are from the community uh, who have come to faith. Another example Uh, would be Ravenhill Presbyterian, who in 2018 had declined to around 50 people. And today they've grown to around 120, including many young families from the local community. So what do these churches do? Well, I'm afraid there is no silver bullet activity that moved them towards fruitfulness because they did different things that worked in their context. Their practices were different, but there are identifiable principles that are the same. So it's a little bit less like a sat-nav that gives you the next steps and more like a compass that kind of guides you in a particular direction. But as a starting point, like Paul in Ephesus, both of these congregations recognize their reality and they were open to new opportunities. And this translated into a willingness to adapt, to try new things. They might not have known what what that might be, um, but there was widespread support to just give it a go. And there are three principles or values that 
commonly shaped everything they did. And those three principles are building relationships, cultivating community, and inviting encounter with Jesus. Building relationships because a relationship with a Christian is often the starting point on, a, on someone's journey of faith. Cultivating community because an experience of genuine Christian community can help overcome some of the baggage that people might have about the Christian faith. And inviting encounter because at an appropriate moment, people need to hear the good news about Jesus. And we want to be ready to share that through our faith story and through the gospel story. So under each of these headings, let's consider some practical ways that might enable a congregation's local witness to grow in these days. Building relationships. This is crucial when it comes to sharing the gospel and our lives as well. A relationship provides a much more natural platform to sharing our faith and also a better place to invite people along to church services or events. We all have a part to play in this as we consider who has God placed around our lives that don't know Jesus. And key groups to reflect upon are those uh, near to us, such as our family, our friends, our colleagues, and our neighbors. How can we be a little bit more intentional with people at the school gate or at our favorite coffee shop or at the sidelines on Saturday's match in ways that allow a relationship to form and deepen? How might we look for opportunities to show kindness through encouraging words or a thoughtful act? We have a little bench at the front of our house uh, that we often sit on and, and we deliberately put it at the front of our house, not, th not at the back. And um, it's very open and it creates opportunities to get to know neighbors as they pass by. People have routines and so very quickly a relationship can develop and, uh, and conversations can deepen. And as this happens, then natural opportunities will arise to share something about our Christian faith about our involvement with church, and that can open up new avenues for, for discussion uh, that can lead a conversation in a direction uh, of talking about our faith. And so consider who has pla God placed around your life who doesn't know Jesus? Who seems to be open to your friendship? As COVID-19 restrictions relax, it will be great to see some of the groups that connect with the community reestablished, such as uniformed organizations or Abbey Tots uh, or your drop-in, alongside the continuation of initiatives such as food provision for the food bank that I know you have been faithful in. And as we think about ways to cultivate community. A community analysis uh, can be a helpful process in highlighting local needs uh, and concerns, and that can be really helpful for a church in discerning where God might be asking uh, you to respond in practical ways. I was really shocked when I discovered from the census data that 37% of homes in Northern Ireland are lived in by a single adult living alone or a single parent with dependent children. 37% of homes with a single adult living alone or a single parent with very young children. That's across the whole of Northern Ireland. Loneliness and isolation are words that spring to mind when I think about this particular statistic. Loneliness and isolation are prevalent in all of our communities and if the, and the experience of the past 18 months has only served to heighten this further. How might churches be able to alleviate this? Well, some churches in PCI and I think 
I remember speaking to Alan and he said, this is maybe one, one example of this where your congregation were involved in this in some way, but I've joined like a good morning team with a telephone vulnerable and elderly members in the community in a prearranged call to, to try to combat loneliness and then respond with practical help as needs arise. What a great initiative to be part of and trying to help people who live alone to feel less lonely. Some churches such as Clocky on the Arts Peninsula and Alexandra in North Belfast have started a drop-in cafe one morning a week for people just to come and meet over a hot drink and a bun as a simple response to loneliness that is greatly appreciated, provides a great opportunity for relationships to be built. Other congregations have sought to connect with the local community through developing interest groups that engage people who wouldn't normally come to church through a shared interest in an activity or an experience, such as cycling or drama or cancer support. And groups like these create a space where unreached people can build relationships with Christians and begin to experience the community of the body of Christ. So consider what sort of groups exist around church that already bring people together. Might some of these be tweaked or ev even occasionally to be more accessible to those outside of church? What sustainable opportunities might God be opening up for members of the church family to connect with unreached people? So building relationships, cultivating community. And lastly, in time through building relationships and finding opportunities for community, God will begin to reveal those around our life with an openness to the Christian faith. And might it be possible to meet them and in initiate conversations that help them to think about faith? PCI have just released a little booklet called Another Look to help you do just that through a variety of themes that reflect on our experience of the pandemic. These are really just conversation starters with some questions in there that you can, you can start and then, and then link into an aspect of our faith. And perhaps at the right moment, you could share your own faith story of how you came to follow Jesus. And the Share resource from PCI has some really helpful training to equip your church with the confidence to do this. Or perhaps you extend an invite along to a church service or event where you know that the gospel will be shared. Some congregations have found that the lifestyle and habits of folks within the community are such that a service on a Sunday morning is a barrier to attendance and have therefore experimented with a more informal service on a Sunday afternoon. West Kirk Presbyterian recently launched a monthly gathering like this uh, in their community center on the Shankill Road. So whatever form it takes, we want to ensure that unreached people with whom we have built relationships with and we have had the opportunity uh, to, to draw into community, we want to ensure that those people have the opportunity to consider and encounter the good news of Jesus Christ. So consider who is around your life that might be open to hear the gospel. What might you be able to develop or invite them to in order to allow this to happen. So as we close, let's imagine. Imagine what it would be like if we all became more intentional in our witness with those around our lives. Building relationships, cultivating community, Inviting people into an encounter with Jesus. Like Paul, reaching new people with a softer tone, but the same gospel message. Imagine the impact that might have in this place and in other places around Ireland. Might we refine our witness outwards in a way that gives greater reach than ever as we share with others, not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. 
And might we trust in the Spirit of God to transform lives, having faith in his word when he says, I will build my church and the gates of hell or a global pandemic or huge societal change will not overcome it. Amen. We're going to close our service by singing again uh, a, a new song, I believe, or a new song that I don't know, but um, For the Cause, isn't that right? Oh, it's a video. Sorry. It's a video that we'll be singing. Do we stand or sit then? Just sit. <laughs> stand together as we close in the words of the, the grace. And often when we, we do this together, we close our eyes, we bow our heads. I'm going to ask you to open your eyes and speak the words of the grace to those around you as we leave here today, reminded of all that God has done for us through Christ. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen.